What's going on, everybody? Welcome into a special weekly recap edition of the Daily Energy Newsbeat Stand Up here on this gorgeous September 28th. 2024. As always, I am Michael Tanner, joined by Stuart Turley. Holy smokes, it's been a long week. It's wow, been a good week though. It is. I'll tell you that it. You know, Michael, four years ago when you and I started doing this podcast, there were a couple episodes we actually had to hunt for stories. I've never seen such craziness going on around the world in the energy market. Yeah, it's there's so much going on. We had some great (laughs) stories that we talked about this week. You know, everything from AI, DOD getting into the oil field, starting to read through emails, EV market went wild. So there was a lot of stuff. You rocked a solo show one time. It's been a great week. Um, But let's go ahead and just kick it off to the team. They've lined up some of the top stories for the week. Before we do that, guys, we got to quickly pay the bills. As always, the news and analysis that you hear is brought to you by the world's greatest website, www.energynewsbeat.com. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. Go ahead and hit that description below for all links to the timestamps, links to the articles, and links to everything you need to be stay in touch with Energy Newsbeat. You can hit us up on Substack. Uh, we also have a great, great oil and gas working interest project that we are partnering up with our friends, Ray Trevino and the Crew Truth, to offer you a basically a chance to become your own oil man. So if you've ever wanted to be able to to walk around and tell people, hey, I invested in oil. Hey. Now's your opportunity. Go ahead and hit that link, investinoil.energynewsbeat.com for a chance, and we will we'll keep it going. But otherwise, Stu, I'm going to go ahead and kick it off to the team. Let's see what's up. Georgia's clean energy outpaces fossil fuels with new nuclear boost. I am so happy that the nuclear community is getting this boost for the first time ever U.S. state of Georgia has more clean power than hydrocarbon fuel power in its grid. Would you have ever thought you'd hear that kind of a title without nuclear in it? I wouldn't. <laughs> well, no, I did not think that. We we it is we are not going to get to any kind of net zero without nuclear. Unit three and unit four at Plant Vogel near Waynesboro, Georgia, have started commercial operations in the past year, making Vodal the biggest nuclear power plant with nearly five gigawatts of total generating uh, capacity, surpassing the 4,200 New Mexico MW Palo Verde plant in Arizona. I've been to that plant in Arizona. That's a beautiful plant. It's a lot of megawatts. Holy smokes. It is. It took 15 years and a cost of $36.8 billion, more than twice the projected timelines. Michael, we can't make the energy transition if we don't behave. We've got to follow in the footsteps of the UAE. UAE did four years under budget and on time. You, you know, in order to do a nuclear reactor, Four years under budget and on time is a formula that we got to figure out. Yeah, I know. It's definitely something that we need to figure out. And yeah, it's, I mean, that's a pretty big, that's a lot of money. But hey, it goes to show that if you can't actually get one of these done, you can, there's a lot of energy and there's a lot of clean energy that can be involved with nuclear, but we have to figure out on the regulation side how to do it for cheaper. Yes. And the other big story this weekend, Michael, was the fact that Amazon is signing up or Amazon, one of the big tech companies is signing up with Three Mile Island for a 20 year extension to Three Mile Island for the ones that did not burn down, burn up or melt down. And I'm excited about that. No, I'm very excited. Now, under that that thirty six point eight billion dollars, if you break that down on a on a per kilowatt per hour basis right. it's actually some of the most expensive energy relative to where you know other forms of energy like natural gas fossil fuels right. all this other stuff so yes it's clean yes we love nuclear but at that price point it really doesn't make any sense and this is maybe the first time I'll agree with the environmentalists you know the quote here from from Britton McCorkle executive director of the Georgia Conservation Voters co-author of the report Votal is a cautionary tale for the rest of the country here in Georgia we're stuck with the most expensive power ever produced 
nothing to take pride in. So it's a double edged sword with some of this nuclear stuff. We've got to br- yes, we love nuclear, but we got to bring that cost down, or else what are we actually doing? We well, when you we could consider- have dumped that into a, we could have had five Keystone pipelines. Exactly, and, and you know why it got that high? Well, it's because- regulations. I'm with you. Yeah, trillions of dollars that the, the Biden Harris administration has cost in regulatory actions. We Absolutely. did that story a month or so ago. EV hit, heavy hitters smash through the guardrails at raising new safety concerns. The weight makes a difference. You know, you got Tyrus, who is a, a huge man as a wrestler. I would not want to wrestle that man. Weight matters when you're driving and inertia and when you're fighting somebody. <laughs> this the you the test used a 7,140 pound 220 2022 Rivian R1 T truck with a barrier at 60 miles per hour with footage on this article showing the heavy EV completely blasting through the guardrail and launching over a concrete wall while sending chunks flying. You know what? If you're a bad guy and you're a terrorist and you want to invoke damage, get an EV. No, I mean, it's it's, it's really, frightening. It's, it's really it's really incredible. And you'd think because a lot of the infrastructure a lot of like the the actual quote unquote engine of an EV is actually in the back and a lot of and it's empty up front, which also which is also scary to think about that the heaviest parts aren't even in the front and they're still slamming through guardrails. It shows you how much new stuff is in this. Now, you know, they'll over time they may or may not figure this out, but I, I, it's a super, super scary thing. And I encourage everybody, if you go click the the link in the article below, you'll have a link directly to this video. Oh, yeah. It, it's frightening. I'll tell you, I do want a Cybertruck. I, I, I'm i just going to let you know right now. I saw the Cybertruck camper, and I mean, I'm like, man, that, that, that's cool. I'm all in. I want a Cybertruck, but as a third car. I don't want it as a primary vehicle. I, I think Cybertrucks, because they're bulletproof, are where we need to go. Is driving electric now more expensive than petrol or diesel? This is actually an, a study that came out of... England, Britain's public charging network, as I'm going to read straight from the article here, is facing criticisms for high costs, making the EV driving potentially twice as expensive as using petrol or diesel cars. On a year-over-year basis, UK has actually added about 2,500 rapid and quote-unquote ultra-rapid charging stations, which is about a 40% increase year-over-year. According to some data that was shared with the Times, these chargers cost an average of 80 pounds per kilowatt hour, which makes it extremely difficult for people who don't have access to a low-cost home charging network to actually make the switch. So, just like in the United States, where we spend all of this money to build out infrastructure that nobody uses, they build out all this rapid charging infrastructure, and now guess what? You can't use it because it's so expensive. What's even funnier is, according to that same report, even those using the slower public chargers may pay more per mile than petrol or diesel. I mean, guys, here's the thing. The reason why gasoline and fossil fuels are currently dominating the market is because they're so efficient. It's the lowest cost, most efficient fuel. It's not just the lowest cost. It's not just the most efficient. It's lowest cost combined with the most efficient. That's what everybody looks for. So the market will gravitate towards things that work. People in the UK want to use EVs. They'd love nothing more. We know we know how they are up there in the UK. I'm sorry if anybody's listening to this from the UK, but we, you, know, you guys are definitely a little bit more left-leaning than us here in the States. So we know you want to use EVs. The problem is you can't because there are unfortunately Unfortunately, too expensive, or they just take too much time. I love how they have to call ultra rapid. It's like oh, it still takes what twenty minutes to charge. So they're they're dying over in the UK due to these EVs. And, and, and again, I think you're gonna, you know, this is something Stu and I have talked about. I think you're going to see people continue to move between hybrids, which gives you a little bit of best of both worlds. California sues Exxon over global plastic pollution. This one's. Pretty unbelievable, folks. So California and several environmental groups sued ExxonMobil on Monday and accused the oil giant of engaging in a decades-long campaign that helped fuel 
plastic waste pollution. California Attorney General Rob Bonta, who spoke in an event, guess what? Climate Week in New York City said that the state sued Exxon Efron, concluding a nearly two-year-long investigation where he says that Exxon has been deliberately misleading the public about the limitations of recycling. This all specifically centers around Exxon's promotion of what they were calling, quote-unquote, advanced recycling, which is a process called prololysis. I don't know, guys. I'm not an English major here. All I know is that this process turns hard to recycle plastics into fuel. He said that this technology slow progress is a sign of Exxon's ongoing deception. Unbelievable. The technology slow progress is a sign of Exxon's ongoing deception. Well, maybe it's a hard problem to solve. Has this dude ever gotten out of his little comfy AG office to figure that out or is he too busy hobnobbing on his private jet that he flew over to New York City to talk at quote unquote climate week where they have the AC cranked up and are probably using Russian gas to do that I mean it's just dripping in irony all of this here's the quote from our our good friend Bonta AG over there today's lawsuit shows the fullest picture to date of Exxon Mogul's decades long deception well I thought it was just a two year long deception over this advanced fuels thing but we won't get into that and we are asking the court to uphold Exxon's fully account Accountable for its role in actively creating and exacerbating the plastic pollution crisis through its campaign of deception. Here's here's Exxon's response. It's a good one, actually. Suing people makes headlines, but solving the plastic waste problem won't. Advanced recycling is a real solution. Has and cal- adding adding that California has done nothing to advance recycling, which is true. They've done nothing to do that. So this again is political retribution because they just don't like Exxon Mobil. And I mean, does Cal does Exxon even have facilities in California? I know Chevron does. So it just it just boggles my mind that you with all of the craziness going on in California, everything that's going on, the, the craziness that's going on in California, this dude assigned his staff to try to sue Exxon Mobil. And guess what? Newsflash, you ain't gonna win because Exxon's gonna have just a few more resources than you have to fight this. And Again, you 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 can't win here. You can't win here. Exxon, if they don't care about recycling and just continue to produce oil, well, they're gonna you know they'll hit them on the climate change front. But if they actually try to do something, this advanced plastics problem, which I is hard. I mean, recycling's tough because newsflash, and I'm pointing at the camera. You guys don't separate your recycling properly enough. If you, the listener, actually separated your recycling better, maybe this stuff would work, but you don't. Okay. So, so they're trying, well, maybe there's some hard to recycle stuff, or maybe there's a mixture. Let's figure out a way to actually recycle that. Then they get burned for that because it's a quote unquote deceptive process. It's unbelievable. It, it, it's why you should, in my opinion, if I was running X, I wouldn't even worry about this stuff. Just sure, let them sue us. It's a write off that we get. We'll, we'll hire some lawyers. There, I mean, there's other stuff going on. I mean, we know the stuff that's going on in West Texas and their fundamentally and their fundamental disregard for the ability to plug old wells. I mean, they should be focused on that stuff, which is actually harming the environment versus this. Oh, we're actually trying to do something. I mean, it's unbelievable. This stuff gets me worked up. You know, I guess environment, you know, you want to read this article. Environmental groups praise the lawsuit. Ocean's plastic campaign director said that California's lawsuit will hold the industry accountable and debunk the plastic recycling narrative that holds us back from real solutions. You know what? I want to debunk your Oceana stuff. That's Christy. That's what I want to do. So just, just unbelievable. As demand drops, automakers reverse EV targets despite billions in Biden Harris subsidies. This is actually abysmal when you consider that the Harris Biden administration had tried to force the United States into EVs. And some of the EV numbers are pretty amazing when you sit back and take a look at, from a global perspective, how many EVs are on the road and how much they've saved in climate change, quote unquote, not much, if at all any. And so, in fact, nothing. 
because by the time you add the extra wear and tear on the tires, they go through the tires twice as much. By the time you add the diesel, you add all of the things it takes to make an EV car. There's been a negligible effect on the environment. In fact, it's about to be a negative impact on the environment when you consider the batteries for all of them that are coming out of service and are going to need to be recycled. And the recycling market for those batteries is non-existent right now. A wide ray, array of automakers have abandoned EV goals since February with Volvo, Ford, and Mercedes-Benz all dialing back electric quotas or dropping previously planned product lines. This is huge. The auto industry's change in direction is despite billions in subsidies doled out to the industry via the 2021 bipartisan infrastructure bill and the 2020 Inflation Reduction Act. Both of those should be called the Porculus Bill Bundle with the White House offering a 7,500 federal tax credit for certain EVs. See, this is where they really did not do any, any favors. Uh, because only the folks that uh, need a $7,500 tax deduction or break can get it, but then it didn't even work on all of the cars. Like only one of the Ford Mustangs would even qualify, and then all the others. So the regulations designed to phase out internal combustion engines, including tailpipe emissions, rule would effectively require 67% of light duty vehicles sold after model year 30, 2032 to be electric or hybrids. It ain't going to happen. And Toyota is leading the charge on the hybrids and the rest of the market is behind. So Ford even canceled plans to produce three row electric vehicle SUV in August and reduced output of its Ford F-150 Lightning pickup in January. The, Ford lost $4.7 billion in 2023, equating to nearly $65,000 per EV it sold. We're not going to launch vehicles unless they're going to be profitable within 12 months of launch. That's pretty strong. Hats off to them. They've got to stay in business and government needs to stay out of the way of business. Russia ramps up Arctic oil tanker shipping to a new record. Michael, with a month left to go that already exceeds, exceeds last year, 15 oil tankers have crossed the Arctic waters so far. Russia has dispatched a record amount of oil through the Arctic Circle. 10.7 million barrels of crude went through the northern sea route. I'll tell you what, them Houthis got a thing going on there. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, it is. I mean, to give, you know, as that compares to last year, this article points oh. out that last year in total, only 14 vessels, which had about 10.5 million barrels, crossed that same northern sea route last year. So they're cranking it up. And, and you're right. It really all has to do with the fact that that Red Sea is shutting down. Cold room. Oh, yeah. Wouldn't want to be on that ship. Oh, no. But it's also think how much is going on. It takes a week to go over the northern crossing from Nova Samalaya in the west to the Bering Strait to the east. There it's 12 to 14 more days to reach the ports of Shanghai and those of northern China. That really saves a lot of good time to use the northern routes. It really does. Now, you know, eventually, obviously, you know, Russia is going to have majority of control of that route. So you don't know some of the chicaneries that go on there. I find it interesting, mm -hmm. you know, the, they, the International six. Tanker Owners Solution Federation, which is a not-for-profit organization that was established on behalf of the world's ship owners to basically just kind of protect and provide effective responses for they are quoted in this article saying the remote, the remoteness, lack of infrastructure and inhospitable conditions in the Arctic means significant logistical and operational challenges must be overcome in the event of an oil spill. And they're not wrong about that. Oh, no, uh, absolutely not. And especially because they're using a lot of the dark fleet, older tankers and self-insured. So if an accident happens, you're going to go up to Putin and go pay up. Right. Hey. hey, I don't think so. 